here today with Aaron Goldman. Aaron, thank you for for coming in today. I appreciate it. No, thanks for having me. I was waiting for the invite. I know it's been <laughs> it's been a while. We were on a hundred and eight or hundred and nine right now episodes. So that's awesome. Yeah, I appreciate it. So, what are you teaching right now, Aaron? What what are you guys doing in your classes? You come right into the Lumen Center after my class finishes up, and I'm sure. always curious what you guys are talking about in your senior elective. Uh, currently, we um, we have Chinese Asia. We just are talking about the rise of Japan around 1880, and then, then the shift to modernize and the fall of the Qing Dynasty in China. And then in the other class, we are talking about um, Judaism, Judaism and Christianity. We just finished. Um, where are we? Isaac and Jacob. Get ready to go into Exodus. We'll skip Joseph. <laughs> Always good stuff. Though. So Japan is interesting. That's that's one place I always tell people is on the top of my bucket list to travel to Japan. I just think their culture is so fascinating. I'd go. My wife wants to go. Love it. Uh, plane ride. <laughs> that's a, yeah. But talk to talk to Joanne Shine. She's been there. Wow. Have you done many tr- trips through Gilman as a faculty member here? I no. And mainly it's because of the family. So I will say. When I first, I would say when I first started here, I did a few trips, uh, professor development, and they were really, really great. I mean, I got to go to Germany and Austria. I got to go to, um, I found a kind of a retreat for, for, at the time I was, it was a Bible class. So I went to this, uh, how to teach Bible in his own Monterey Peninsula. So I went to some pretty cool places for sure. But um, since, since I've had kids, I am pretty much the, summer daycare so it's, it's limited my ability to to take advantage of some of these opportunities what was germany and austria like what was that trip oh it was unbelievable i got to see um i sent it around holocaust and i have a brother who lives in salzburg so he was able to set me up with some tour guides i met an author um, i think and was able to interview him i went to dachau i went to a couple other um eagle's nest where hitler's kind of um was bunkered up and holed up in there. Um, it was really cool. Um, mm-hmm. We spent weeks there, and I went with another friend from high school, so we he was just along for the ride. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. I thought the assembly we had a few weeks ago with the speaker um, from Gilman, he's a Gilman alum, and I, I want to try to get him on a podcast, but he brought in the the desk oh. or the chunk of marble from Hitler's desk. That was wild. That was awesome. I was one of the, I think you were you with me in the back when we, yeah when we got called down there yeah I'm gonna have him come to my class um, so he doesn't know that yet <laughs> but he will definitely be coming so the class is titled Holocaust Studies Holocaust Studies yeah so when did you first start teaching that class and how did you I guess build that curriculum so I copied um, so. <laughs> Like all great ideas, Mr. Ju- Peter Julius, who was the head of the department, history department at the time when I started in 2004, um, he was teaching the class along sometimes with Jamie Spragan. So they co-taught it on and off. Um, and Peter kind of planned his retirement. So he passed the class on to me. And I, I'm trying to remember, I think Alex DeWeese was in the, my first class ever teaching it. So his senior year would have been that that year, around 2010 maybe, I'm guessing, mm-hmm. um, maybe even earlier than that. And I kind of used his material, Peter Peter and Jamie Spriggan's material for, for the first couple, couple years, and then I sort of added and subtracted as I saw fit to make it more my own. But it was, um, it's a great class, uh, and, and I haven't looked back. I know you read Mouse, and I'm still working through Mouse, and you gave me the meta mouse book that i yeah. that i have to get through but what else is a part of that curriculum in in the holocaust studies well currently um it's history the first the first quarter is history the second quarter is english so the first quarter is a lot of pds we do christopher browning davidovitz and these kind of uh different historical interpretations of, of how the holocaust came to be it's not the who what where when it's the how and the why is the big question um and I've shifted actually to a whole lot of primary source documents. Um, so that's what I had the kids really read, primary sources from 1920s and 30s um, right now for the, for the first two months. 
Then the second quarter is in, uh, more of the English, and we were, currently we read Survival in Auschwitz, um, Mouse, and we the question we ask is how should we be talking about it? How should we represent it? Um, we, we don't do any survivor testimony much anymore, but there's some primary source testimony that we do read. I think Christopher Browning is an interesting place to start because it helps students, it helps anyone wrap their minds around how the Holocaust could come to be and how just ordinary police officers, regular people can just devolve into the wrong path or turn evil almost. Right, right. So we read uh, Police Battalion 101 about average Germans who end up becoming murderers. Um, And I think it's, as I say in the class, like men are created and can be very good and evil too. Yeah, I think that's one of the actually most important things that you can you can learn, I guess, growing up is that people are not just all good or all bad. There's that quote from Solzhenitsyn that the, the line of the human heart separates it into good and evil or the line, what is the line? It's the line between good and evil separates every human heart. And, right. uh, and I talk a lot about that idea in my leadership and character class too. We watch a little bit of um, the Stanford prison experiment, which I don't know if you've seen that, but it's about, you know, everyone kind of studies or hears about it in psycho- psychology classes growing up, but it's about this experiment that was done in Stanford's basement. And they pretty much siphoned off, you're the prison guards, you're the um, inmates amongst a group of, you know, 20, 30 people. And you just watch and see how the prison guards turn evil incrementally throughout this whole mock experiment. And um, I think it really goes hand in hand with Christopher Browning, Ordinary Men. Right. And there's also another experiment. I think it's Millman who does the shock and they just, the idea of obedience and following, it was a different spin on it, but yeah, Mm -hmm. uh, certainly we'll follow directions sometimes against our own moral compass. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And I saw that you, and, and I want to talk to you about a couple of speeches or, or um, presentations that you've given recently. And one that I saw that you gave over at RPCS about the Holocaust um, recently. What did you talk about in that presentation? Uh, so that's the second year I've been invited to do a similar speech. But I talk about, again, the build up to the Holocaust and the... And I don't want to, I'm trying to clarify this. I don't want to be kind of misinterpreted here, but this idea that it's not a vacuum. And I talk about all these world events that are occurring at the same time. So we often hear like, uh, where's the outrage of the world? Why didn't the world stop it, et cetera? And I try to point out that the United States was segregated and with Jim Crow laws and then these ideas, these, and it's not that, not that the United States was going to end up in general. I'm trying to make a comparison, but I'm trying to put the world in context of a kind of like a the psyche of 1920s and 30s to say yeah we were we were a segregated segregated nation then too um england and you have the the economic depression so i kind of talk about all these world events that that don't always get emphasized i think when you know, at least in eighth grade they're, they're studying they're just talking about 1945 1942 holocaust you know that's three-year period and i'm focused on kind of this build up and and I try to put um, put a lot of it in in historical context to show that there's a lot more here that makes it complicated, mm-hmm. I suppose. And that's and I and I and I point out similarities and significant differences um, that allow for some. And I put this in air quotes if you can see me. Inspiration from Hitler. There's evidence that the Nazis studied these laws to try to create a. A pure society, meaning these laws, the Jim Crow laws, or looked at how the West was won and expanded upon, and they made their conquering of the East in the war very similar, or air quotes again, similar in their own warped way mm-hmm. to conquering the West of the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. Mm-hmm. So I, I try to kind of just show these different models of yeah, history. What was actually happening on the world stage? I think a really interesting way to study that would be to to attend the Franklin Roosevelt Museum, which I actually had the chance to to check out for the first time this past summer, and it's in Hyde Park, New York, where he grew up. And there's a whole, you know, you've got the 
house where he grew up and then this whole museum about him and you walk through the rooms and and you really realize all of the things that are happening in the early 1930s that you know complicated his presidency and, and I guess complicated the world at the time the things that are happening in the United States you've got the Great Depression going on you've got the rise of Hitler um, Franklin Roosevelt had his own personal battles with his polio that he was working through all of these things I just can't imagine being in his position in that time because it seemed like the world was just crumbling and he had to lead the country I probably have to read up on FDR a little bit because I'm now intrigued. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, but I agree. but that's right. That's the complicating parts that I would try to emphasize is this whole world mm-hmm. and, and the attitudes towards and what I would say even more right from the depression you get xenophobia and some other kind of I can understand why I don't necessarily always agree with but I can understand why. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when Hitler. Uh, came to power, what was actually happening in, in Germany in the world stage as you understand it to allow for someone like him to, you know, gain authority and to be so popular? I think he spread a message of German hope for to rise out of the ashes of World War One and the humiliating treaties and the high inflation. And um, he ran on a platform to to kind of make Germany this new national country on the world stage and people bought in um, as early, you know, we know now where he was leading, but there was, there was intertwined German nationalism, German racism, and by racism, it's anti-Semitism. And, and they're kind of his, this his ideas of race and space and nationalism were all intertwined in one. So it's hard to separate in his mind, but he had a message for the German people, I think, that was going to make Germany this European nation on power with the the, the countries that beat him in World War One. Mm-hmm. And people were so desperate, really, to, that they were easily persuaded by his by his speaking, his ideas, his nationalistic. Uh, view or vision of the country and and I don't think just to be clear also I don't think the majority of people saw genocide as the as the end all right I think there were probably some within this kind of secret society or or you know ultra Nazi ideology that that were buying into that but I don't think the majority of Germans or Jewish people or anybody or the world saw the end game of 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 Hitler and and when he was elected, I think most people thought it would be a normal election. He'd serve his two, what, four years and move on. Or, mm-hmm. um, I don't think anybody really predicted um, 1939 and 42. But um, we often look at history with 21st century hindsight. And I try to get the class to kind of shift shift that I um, that way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um I've been thinking about history a lot. I'm actually teaching an American history class next year, so I'm trying to learn a little bit and refresh my memory on a lot of figures in American history. But I like the concept of, you know, studying history with a lens for all of the different things that were happening at the time um, and and creating as full of a picture as possible. I mean, you're never going to get a complete picture of what was happening, but I think, you know, adding together all the different elements that make up a, a, a time period or event is important in putting together that puzzle, which is history. Yeah, I'd agree. And that's that's exactly what I try to do with this kind of niche spot. I'd imagine it's probably more challenging when you're doing a survey course, but um, certainly when you do electives and you can really do a deep dive into it, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's necessary, I think. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a good approach. So during your presentation at RPCS and in your Holocaust Studies course, what is it that you really want your students or the people attending the lecture to kind of take away? What is your main, I guess, aim for them as they as they leave your class or that presentation? Maybe there are two different questions there. Well, there I I think I can answer because um, there have been. When I was in when I was in college, I had Professor Dobkowski, and he kind of said he he taught took almost all his classes, Jewish studies, Jewish history, Holocaust, and sort of his message was, now it's your turn to go and, like, if you can do one thing for me, 
it's educate people, keep talking about it, keep this right, this idea of never forget, never again. And that's how I start out my presentation at, at Roland Park is this idea of um, now, look, you need to learn, meaning the you eighth graders in this case, you need to learn about this so it doesn't, right, we have to remember that, again, humans are capable of great evil. We have to look at the warning signs and figure out how to, uh, what they do with it. I hope they do good, right? But that's that's what I want them to take away, whether they remember a date or a, or a person's name or that's irrelevant to me. I'd like to think they can, mm -hmm. but just this idea of how it builds, how it happens and, and um, potentially, right? Can it happen again? I hope not. Mm -hmm. But that's that's what I want them to take away, and that's why I've always that's why I want to keep teaching the Holocaust. It, it's that important to me to to remind, and I think it can be applied to lots of different parts of history. Yeah, yeah, it's that idea of of the capacity for evil that you know you kind of have to keep reminding yourself of the the psychology of human nature. Right, I agree. So, uh, Aaron, my other question for you is about your latest presentation about Jackie Robinson that you did. Why did you decide to do a presentation on Jackie Robinson? And, you know, why is that interesting to you? So I grew up reading biographies and that's what I did. And I, I grew up reading biographies of baseball players and so forth. Um, and to this day, I'm, I guess it kind of stuck with me, right? I, I do history, I did baseball. And if you notice, the presentation was a little bit of baseball, it was a little bit of history, but it was also sort of geography and the movement of baseball teams and sort of how it works. And I think, again, going back to this kind of critique of how we teach history sometimes, and, we're, and I'm guilty of it. I think anybody that's in the educational field is this idea of like, we learn a story and that's the rehash version of it bullet pointed down and we move on and i think history is as we said a lot more complicated and so um i like to shed light on this idea of of, of hank aaron and i biased i kind of got into hank aaron because of the name and i was like that's pretty cool right aaron and aaron. <laughs> i was like it's pretty simple but um this idea that that there was a lot more to breaking color barriers in MLB than say Jackie Robinson end of the story. I'm not trying to discredit he 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 did it and and I say that rightfully so. But there's lots of other stories in there that I think are are worth telling. And I thought the the idea of how it concludes with um, Finn Scully saying that you know a black man getting a standing ovation in the Deep South is just like, still brings chills to me. I'm like that's pretty cool in 1974 like right in the heart of the civil rights movement really so so did you learn about these baseball figures growing up through your reading of biographies is that where it started that's, that's what i do that's baseball's my hobby that's what i do and you'll know i have shrines i still do yeah i still follow baseball i yeah baseball history ken burn all of it mm. yeah oh is there a ken's Bur ken burns about baseball oh yes there you go it's awesome. You should I'm, check I that one out. I was watching the Civil War one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ken Burns does baseball, and it's uh, each inning is a decade. Hmm. So did you play baseball growing up, or how did you get into the sport? I played baseball growing up. And you just, I, just loved played, it and I, wanted to? I love it. It's just, yeah, I mean, it's awesome. I'll give you random facts. I'll brag. I was a three-time state champion, 88, 89, 90. Little League, Little League, Babe Ruth. Played all summer as long as I could. Mm. Did you um, did you grow up around here, or where are you from? Westminster, Maryland, Carroll County, so just north and west of uh, Baltimore. Now, as a young baseball player, did you have big dreams about making it to the MLB? I'm sure Absolutely. you did. Absolutely. All of my and, friends until, played baseball. <laughs> until I played on a 90-foot diamond, <laughs> and I realized that's a long way to hit the ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely had. And and you know, the, the, the cool thing is for me, and I'm going to actually have a Zoom with these guys tomorrow night. They're all over the country, but we're friends because of basically Little League. And it's and we're high school friends all the way through. We still stay in touch. Um, so And we'll Zoom tomorrow. So that's what, I mean, it kind of brought together my childhood and lifelong friends through baseball. It's funny. A lot of my friends who grew up that they have, they were on a really successful 
uh, youth baseball team that went to Cooper, is it Cooperstown? In, oh, that'd be in New York, but then maybe Williams Williamsport. Yeah, it was Bristol, a, Connecticut. They were on one of those yeah, big yeah. teams growing up. Cooper, Cooperstown, they have a big tournament, I think. I think that's what yeah. it was. I think it was Cooperstown, and a lot of them ended up playing baseball in college. But my good friends who are baseball guys put you know put everything towards this dream of making it big and it took them to some really interesting places because you really have to play baseball all the time to get to get good of it good at it just like any sport but one of my friends did a whole summer in like dodge kansas i think middle of the country living with the family playing baseball all summer long i mean it's just it's interesting how you know how that dream of becoming big and, and making it to the mlb can take you to so many different parts of the country yeah, I wish it took me there. <laughs> to this day, I still think, yeah. Did you but, have Did you have mentors growing up who helped you with the sport? Oh yeah, they. I mean, and actually, they're the two of them are my friends that I'll zoom tomorrow. One of them is his dad. Another guy passed. Uh, two of them have passed away. Um, but yeah, I can name them all. We they were super super, and they they taught me. They didn't just teach about as as any coach, and I'm sure you can relate to. They didn't just teach me about baseball, but I remember like. Uh, one time, I think I was like 10 years old, I threw a glove after an error and pulled me aside. We don't do, you know, we don't do that. I've never thrown any sporting equipment ever again. I said, I learned a lesson. Um, so it was also about sportsmanship. It was about um, much, much um, more than just like how to throw a ball or hit a ball. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, I, and I remember that like it was yesterday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, sports, that's the beauty of sports is that you can learn so much that translates into life, you know, not to throw something out of frustration. I think part of that, too, is not showing your opponent that you're frustrated or you're angry and keeping your cool. Um, But, yeah, so many great life lessons. Right. Right. And I mean, I can I can name them all. And then and I don't remember exactly what was said, but I remember I remember not to do it. (laughs) I remember how to act and again, control your emotions when you're when you're down. Yeah, it's tough for a ten year old, but it yeah. stuck with me. I never actually, I didn't play one inning of baseball in my life. I just was given a lacrosse stick when I was born, and that was the end of it. I didn't even play t-ball. I don't think. I never played lacrosse. <laughs> <laughs> so when you got to Gilman, you coached baseball. You coached some soccer, right? Did fresh soft soccer, fresh soft baseball, JV soccer, JV baseball at different points, but yeah. How did you get to Gilman? What was your kind of your story to, to coming here? I think God did it. Well, I, so I was teaching for five years at Kennedy Krieger, which is all special ed uh, school. Um, and I did it the old-fashioned way. I answered a, an, an ad in the Baltimore Sun Wow, for, for, for teachers. Um, I originally actually applied to be 10th grade years. They had a history teacher. And then when I showed up, they said, oh, well, we have an opening at the time. Again, religion was a was a required class for all ninth graders, and they had an opening for religion, and kind of a great story here because I got to call my dad. So when I uh, and, and Eva Turner had looked at my resume and said, "Oh, I see you have a religious studies major. Would you be interested in this?" I said, "Sure," and it all worked out. But I got to call my dad afterwards because I remember when I was in college, he said, "What do you major in religious studies? What is this? When are you going to ever use it?" And I got to call him and say, "I got hired to." Teach, teach, religion. teach religion. Wow. Yeah. So in 2004, I answered an, an ad in the Baltimore Sun. <laughs> when did, um, I've been wondering this actually for a while. So, you know, we talk about mind, body, spirit here at Gilman and religion was a class for a while. And then, you know, now you've got your own senior electives that you teach. But when was religion not a required class for students at Gilman? Um, it, it sort of morphed into a... It, it, what it eventually became what we would call today is the world cultures course. And basically what had happened, and, and it makes sense, um, this to me at least it makes sense. I still think religion is important. Um, but we were finding as we were very Eurocentric in our history department and students weren't getting necessarily a big, broad world history. Um, they went from European history in 10th grade to mm-hmm. 11th grade uh, U.S. history to electives where they could pick and choose, but there was no kind of 
uh, global, or whether something about India or China, et cetera, and all these spaces. And so it kind of morphed into um, the, the beginning I, um, shift from that was we went from religion, and we did, we did Judaism, Christianity, we did Western religion and Eastern religion. So they were getting that already. Um, and then we kind of made it a full year course, and then we morphed it into more of this, um, what it is now, this world cultures course. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of how it followed. And, and again, something had to give. Yeah. And, and that, was the, that was the shift. But it's, I, think, I think there's value in both. And, and I made it kind of a, a mission to bring kind of what I, what I like to teach, this idea of religion back as senior electives. And it's, it's been great. And it's been like the last three or four years we've been able to, to land that. So you teach re religion or you teach various forms of religion here at Gilman now, and you started teaching religious studies when you first got here, studied religious studies in college. Why do you think that was so interesting to you, you know, in college and coming out of college? I think, um, I think I've always been, so I grew up, my mom is, or my mom was Christian. My dad's Jewish. I grew up in a mixed household. I celebrated a lot of, um, different holidays, um, even the marriage of my parents was kind of controversial and there was always some, some tension, but I think I was always interested in um, um, this idea of religion and, and sort of the differences and the similarities as I was kind of growing up, kind of going back and forth between Judaism and Christianity and living in Carroll County. I, had, I was one of a handful of Jewish kids. There weren't many at all. And I think that sort of was the foundation for it. And I've always sort of also kind of liked this idea of like the big questions, the why are we here and so forth. And, and, and as I became older and older, I kind of like, oh, there's a lot of other ways to attack this. Um, also as a kid, I read mythology and all the great creation stories and Greeks and Romans and, and Norse and such. So I've always been interested in those type of stories to begin with. Um, and when I got to college, I just kind of found stuff that I liked. <laughs> I worried about the rest later. Yeah. That's what, that's my advice for other students too. Uh, so if you're going forward, just take what you like, you'll figure it out. Yeah. I like that. So what did you take in college that was really memorable for you in this, in this major? I, I'm, oh, so I majored in two professors. <laughs> mentioned one, Dob Ka Professor Dobkowski and another one, Professor Flynn. And whatever they taught, I took. And one happened to be kind of like uh, European history, Professor Flynn. One was Jewish studies with Professor Dubkowski, and I took. And then the next thing, I look up, and I have practically two majors. So I just had to figure out senior year what to do, mm -hmm. and I made it work. Um, but that I would, and that's what I tell us: I find the teachers you like, go to them, and they've been great. Yeah. So, so that's sort of that. That's what I did. Yeah, I like that. I mean, you know, sometimes you take the teacher because you've got a relationship with them, you trust them, you know that you're going to learn a lot, whether about the subject or just about life through their lectures and your interactions with them. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it worked for me, their style of teaching. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that just worked. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, that's how I chose classes. Mm -hmm. So now when you're teaching religious studies at Gilman or you're teaching religion, where do you start and where do you really want to go with, with your classes in that, in that subject? I think um, it's different. When we teach Eastern religions, because there doesn't seem to be as much of a, of a majority background um, in, in Eastern religions, I, I slow it down. We use Houston Smith, as, which is a classic text. He's a little tough, but I try to translate it into 21st century high school high school words uh, um, I just want them to really the goal I think to, is to get the students to understand there's a whole lot of worldviews out there mm -hmm. um, and that can be about society it can be about whether it's the divine and God but it's also religion kind of encompasses a lot more than just sort of a God man relationship we talk about rules or ethics or diet and I just want them to understand that that Again, there's a lot of different world. There's seven billion people in the world, so let's let's just look at how people have think or have thought over over the course of thousands and thousands of years. And I think that's the end goal: is just to 
expose them to say something they might not always think about. Mm -hmm. Take take 80 minutes uh, every other day and, 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 and venture off. Is Islam the world's largest religion? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, it might be. If it's not, it will be soon. Uh, mm -hmm. Islam might be uh, passing Christianity. I'd have to double check. So you look at Islam, you look at Hinduism, Buddhism a little bit. A little bit, yeah. Judaism, Christianity. And Confucianism. Oh, you look at Confucianism. We do a mini unit at the very end in, in, in January. Is Confucianism... So is that popular in China today? No, but it's so influential. Well, yes and no. It's, it's there, but I think it's highly influential over the thousands of years of Chinese history that um, I think it's worth exploring. And actually, we do a, one of the cool, another borrowed assignment from an old teacher from Mr. Ryan Carey. Um, we rewrite the Gilman Honor Code in Confucian Values. Ooh. So that's our final project. So we do that when we come back in January um, and try to make Confucianism kind of Gilman-esque, if you will. I took a class in college um, that was known as a gem. It's like one class that you, you know, to yeah, lighten yeah. your load a little yeah. bit. And it was called Chinese philosophy. And there are a lot of athletes that took this class. It was a very popular course. But I got a lot out of it because I had never thought about Confucius. Confucius and Lao Tzu yeah, and yeah. some of these Chinese ancient Chinese philosophers who had so much wisdom and so many things to think about um, in different ways that you normally wouldn't. So I, I think that's so important to consider, at least expose yourself to. All right. And again, going back, that's the goal, right? There's all this, what do we call it? The, the world's wisdom is literally the title of the book that supplements our other, other readings. And it's just these excerpts from all these sacred texts. So let's look at what the world's wisdoms can still offer. Um, yeah, and you can you, you know you could read a, a a passage by Confucius or Lao Tzu or one of the Chinese philosophers and and remold it and and, and think about it from a twenty first century lens in a lot of ways. Right, and I think I think the students get that. I mean, it's it's um, some days are better than others, but I think they I think they they they're thinking and they understand. Uh, sometimes even more than they realize. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's not now, it'll be a little bit later. So so where along your journey at Gilman uh, did you decide to become a dean? And what, I guess, what inspired that decision? I think, um, so, at, at Kennedy Krieger, is all, it was all about, so when I first started, it was all about kind of behavior management. It was, a um, we dealt with... Um, emotionally disturbed kids and, and uh, a lot of kids who were on, on the autistic spectrum that really couldn't control. And it was always this behavior piece of it. But I also view kind of being a dean as, as just another teacher. And sometimes as I, and one of my lines is, I'm, I'm actually like, these are the lessons that you really need to learn, mm -hmm. right? And I'd rather kids learn and the students learn um, when they make mistakes. Inevitably, we all make mistakes in a place that's going to you know, hopefully, you know, I think, I think the line that stuck with me is compassion and accountability. Um, we care about you and we want to see you do better and we call them out a little bit. Um, so I've always been interested in these uh, the ideas of, of, of something a little larger than, say, learning about, I don't know, history or religion. But, mm -hmm. you know, actually getting students to think about who or what they, who, are, who they are, what they want to be how they want to get there. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes those, those mistakes help us help to define us. Right. Um, and, and they, those are often the biggest lessons you can learn in high school. And that sort of was the attraction of it. I, I still view being a Dean as a teacher mm -hmm. um, of just different subject, I guess. Yeah. That's a good way of looking at it. Were you here at Gilman when the Gilman five was implemented or was that before? No, that there? was, I remember it. Yeah. I was here for that, and they sent out a survey. I think it was under Mr. Schmidt, and we actually talk about this in the, under Confucianism, matter of fact, this idea of deliberate tradition and um, taking the survey and figuring out what the key words or, or what the key characteristics that someone from Gilman would be associated with, whether it's honor or respect, and, the, and somehow it got narrowed down. I don't know what happened behind the scenes. Oh, I didn't know it was a survey amongst the faculty. What, faculty and alumni, and it went... If I remember right, it went 
it went everywhere to students from kindergarten or at that time, I don't know if we had pre-K, but kindergarten to 12, they would write down, write down the five uh, characteristics you think Gilman, Gilman graduates should have or Gilman students should have, which would be emphasized. And I forget the phrasing, but, mm -hmm. and somehow they whittled it down to these five. And there was a lot of overlap, whether some people say, again, honor and respect or, um, so that I think they kind of figured out which words to, to keep, but I don't know how that was decided, but it was, um, yeah, it went out. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So before that time, was there a, a code, an honor code or oh, a, or a motto a, that yeah. we operated on? There was always the honor code for sure. Um, and I'm not sure about the idea of, um, you know, I don't know where excellence or humility necessarily came out of this, mm -hmm. uh, but they were always tenets of, of what a, a Gilman person should be. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I don't think anything was necessarily radical. I think it was just codified into something that we deem important. Yeah. Yeah. It can point to. Now, um, now as a Dean, what do you really look forward to about that position and what really, what are the challenge, main challenges of, you know, being a Dean at Gilman? Because we don't have here at Gilman, you know, too many outrageous issues that happen. I mean, uh, amongst the student body, I mean, there's, you know, tucking your shirt in and some, some cheating sometimes. And, but what, what are the main, I guess, challenges? Uh, what I don't look forward to is tucking your shirt in and put a, right in, staying in dress code as I wish I could just record myself or, <laughs> or something like it. That gets a little mundane and old, but um, I think, I think what I, what I enjoy the most is, uh, and the most rewarding is when, when students realize that there's a lot of adults that actually really do care about them. And so, and sometimes that takes the adult pulling them up from their, their mistake. And we do have students that make mistakes and, and it's not always about punishing it's about changing behavior and so that's my philosophy is I have to change their behavior so they can become better and I tell students and parents I'd rather them make mistakes here in this kind of loving community mm -hmm. um, where we do care about you as opposed to somewhere else where they may or may not so I think the reward is when students realize that um, you know a cynical high school student everybody's out to get me, nobody right. And all they ever tell me is to tuck in my shirt or something like this, it gets so old. But then when something happens, they, they do realize that, that we're there for them yeah. and, and have their back. Yeah, I mean, it's about growth. And then you, you really said it, I think uh, more important than all of the subject matter and the tests and the quizzes and the grades that you get here at Gilman, I think when you, what you're bringing into the world is hopefully growth from freshman year to senior year, or if you go here from, you know, right. from middle school through senior year is growth and character. And I think that's what, you know, you're, you're really trying to do is help character build. Right. And I think that's, that goes to the heart of the mission. You, I mean, you see when we, we hear about, um, you know, make these, these students become members of their society, right? Giving members of the community and, and, and so forth. And I think that's that's what we're trying to do. And I think, so at graduation, it's it can be pretty cool to see these guys walk across the stage and see all this growth and development. And I, I think we do a great job of preparing students to make a difference, mm -hmm. a positive difference in the communities that they will, they will be going off to. It's a little messy. It's never linear, mm -hmm. and it's tough and challenging. And some days are frustrating. There's no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it's also super rewarding. But we live in a in, in a business. Education's a business of delayed gratification. So it takes a little bit while. It takes a little while to see it. Can I ask you? And this might be a difficult question, but you know, in your career. Uh, have you really, I mean, there are probably so many different instances of this, but a moment of recognition of that, that delayed gratification for you when you student came back to you or you looked at a student who's out in the world and now doing great things. I mean, I'm sure it happens all the time, but are there any examples that come to your mind? I'll give you an example that happened not too long ago. Um, so I played tennis and I'm, I'm over at the tennis facility randomly as a, 
always run into a Gilman person right now. Run into a Gilman person. I'm like, oh, how's your son doing? He, I think the son's probably 29. And, and the dad remembered who I was, remembered me teaching his son in ninth grade. said, oh, really? You know, and it, it was all... And then I find out he's successful and living in D.C. And I mean, I'm like, that's so cool to hear that, you know, probably I'm doing the math. And it's like 15. Is that 15 years later? Possibly mm-hmm. that they one, they still remember. They still thankful. They're they're gracious. And then, and although it wasn't this, I said, I'll tell him I said hi. And sure enough, they, I see him like the next week. So, oh, yeah, he said hi. And it's just even though it was an indirect conversation, um, the support of the family, the, and the, to find out this guy, this student, now man, 30-year-old man, is an active, positive contribution to, to, to D.C. He's doing great. Yeah. And I think that's those are the stories that I love to hear, right? So even if it's college guys, they come back, but even later on when, when they come back and, they, and they've been you know out in the workforce or they have families, it's really, really, really cool. Yeah, we did a podcast a couple of weeks ago, and the book recommendation was called "The Power of Moments." And um, the the person we were talking to on there is he works at a different school. He's a head of school at Dairyfield, and he was talking about how um, different moments on a day to day basis can have such a huge impact on somebody's mm-hmm. life, especially you know in our in our jobs talking with students and these disciplinary issues that come up are periods of growth that can be defining moments for them that maybe at the time they don't realize are so important and significant. But, you know, years later when they're working in D.C. and they're thinking back to their experience at Gilman, that moment in 11th grade really had a big impact on them. Right. Or not throwing your glove. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are moments in everybody's life with defining moments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I hope I hope that um, I try to remember that, right? I try to remember. You never know, as you said, you never know when those moments are or for that person they will be. Um, so we try to try to make do the best we can, and, and, and I think we're doing a pretty good job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Aaron, let's get to your book recommendation. I actually listened to this book uh, on audio. I didn't make it through the whole thing, but it was really, really well written. W- what did you bring in? And if we wouldn't mind holding it up to the camera. Where am I going? Empire of the Sun and the Moon, Empire of, or the Summer Moon. I'm sorry, Empire mm-hmm. of the Summer Moon. It's about the um, again history, uh, but it's about kind of how the Comanches uh, of the of the the West Texas and and how they kind of shape this Texas frontier, um, and it brings in Mexico. It brings in um, the expanding United States Army and and sort of the the other um, the dying civilization or the, the the changing civilization of the Native Americans and it's just it's a well written nonfiction book that is awesome and the violence that's described in there is incredible right I mean it's it's very vivid it's vivid it's not for the faint of heart mm-hmm. however it I think I think it's pretty accurate and mm-hmm. I think it happened um, and again an, another side note when I was in my biography phase of kids, I would always read Native Americans. That's that was where I where I went. So that's one of the appeals for me for this book. Interesting. Yeah, like, Any ones that you remember? I read Geronimo over and over and over in seventh grade. I read Chief Joseph. Um, those were the two that probably stood out the most. Mm-hmm. Uh, their biographies, and then of course um, the Sitting Bull, and, and basically the big major Native American chiefs that we would hear about. Huh. But I never read. The reason it appealed to me, I never read much about the Comanches. Now, where did do you remember where the Comanches really, where their territory was? I think it was Texas, Texas maybe Oklahoma, Texas, Oklahoma, and into Arizona. So they would um, kind of go up into with the Utah. I think the Utes and the Apaches of, of Arizona. So they kind of carved out this large swath of of Texas, Oklahoma, Midwest, real dry mm-hmm. horse horse. They were horse uh, horse riders, and um, yeah, but across West Texas. There's a book. Um, I'm not sure if you read this, and I need to look up the title because I'm drawing a blank on it. Uh, it's by Cormac McCarthy, and it's called Blood Meridian. And Justin Baker teaches it. I'm sure you've talked to him about it. But that book is, whenever that book comes up, I say 
that book is more violent and bloody than I think any movie yeah. I've ever seen. I've read I've read Blood Meridian. I think it might have been the one or maybe the other. Cormac. I haven't read much of Cormac McCarthy other than that book, uh, but I remember it and it was violent. Yes. Yeah. Um, my brother loves Cormac McCarthy, so he and I, he's the one to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you pick this book up and um, and? Uh, who recommended it to you, or how'd you get your hands my, on it? My dad passed it on to me, and so every time, like that's what we do. So, um, I give him books, and he gives me books. Mm-hmm. Um, that's sort of our our gifts to each other. Like at, I don't know the holidays or whatnot. I said, well, "What are you reading?" And I'll pass something on, and he passed it on a couple of years ago. I was like, "All right, I'll try it." And sure enough, I like it a lot. Now, what's your favorite biography you've ever read about a person? Ooh, favorite biography. I think I, I don't know. Too hard of a question. Yeah. I was doing so well. You stumped me. Yeah. Well, um, I was reading a little bit of the Harry Truman biography, which I've been finding interesting. I mean, it's a, such a big book. It's hard to read biographies. I think if I had to, the most recent, I think, would be the Hank Aaron biography. I mean, that, that I drew the assembly from. Yeah. That was really good. All right. Well, thank you very much for the book, Rack. Hopefully people thank will you. check that out. I've got that on... Uh, audio book which is i think pretty good too but it's probably a little bit better to read it um and aaron thank you very much for doing the podcast today thanks for coming in thank you for having me jake appreciate it all right